Hello, Soundies. Welcome to our Sound for Video session today. I forgot to turn on one thing. One second. There we go. I'm just trying to reduce the number of fans running in the room here. I hope you all had a great week. And let's go ahead and jump into our agenda and show you what we've got to talk about today. First, these are two questions that uh, people submitted previously and um, suggested topics. And one was... Uh, somebody, and I, and I apologize, I don't remember who said this, but said that they ex they sensed that there was some animosity sometimes, or maybe at least conflict. Animosities can maybe kind of strong, but some conflict between the sound and camera departments from time to time on set when you're working on any sort of set, whether it's a commercial, a narrative film, uh, corporate video, whatever. Um, sometimes a little bit of conflict between camera and sound departments and, you know, wanted to know what I recommend to do about it. I've definitely experienced some of that. Um, but I think there are some just com some simple things and you can't control other people, but you can control how you um, act and react you know, on set. So we'll talk about a couple things there. Next, we'll talk about isotope ozone. And there was a question that was posed several weeks ago, in fact, when we were, I think we were demonstrating RX or possibly DaVinci Resolve. I don't remember the context exactly, but somebody said, hey, could you use isotope ozone? to process your spoken word audio, your dialogue audio? And the answer is, let's check. <laughs> let's try it out and let's see what happens. And then we do have a question that was submitted ahead of time. And of course, we'll go to the chat after that. So why don't we start with this, this um, topic of conflict between sound and camera departments. So uh, let, me, let me just characterize this in, in the ways I've experienced it. And I haven't seen like major, major animosity. I've seen possibly competing interests and, you know, sometimes when you needed to kind of work things out, um, I've had to, you know, working with the gaffer or camera people figure out exactly, okay, what's, where's my line? You <laughs> know, Where do I need to hold this microphone or boom this microphone? And there are always these interactions that you have to have to to make sure you know that you're working together as a team to achieve the final product, the, the final video. So, I think there's sometimes animosity or this conflict arises under these kind of circumstances. Here, for example, um, sometimes people assume that video or film is a purely visual experience, and and it's not. It's it's broader than that, of course. Obviously, there's a sound element as well. But what will happen is it usually takes the gaffers or the camera department longer to set up lighting than it would take for the sound group, sound mixer or production sound mixer or location sound mixer to get ready for the next shot, the next take, whatever that case, the case may be. Um, and a lot of times the camera department is substantially larger on, at least on bigger sets, than the sound department is. And so there... I think, I think from my point of view, there is a really fine line to walk when you, when you are operating as the sound mixer or this, or the location sound person. And I think that is that you, you have to communicate, but you need to not over communicate. I think that you can annoy people if you ask too many questions, um, but you can also annoy people if you don't ask enough questions or coordinate your efforts well enough. So for example, if the, if uh, the lighting the gaffers are setting up lighting and there's not going to be anywhere for you to hold a boom pole that doesn't cast a shadow, you can go and, and have a talk with them and say, Hey, just FYI, I'm going to have some, I'm going to have a rough time getting a boom in here, or I don't have room or, um, you know, w w l let's work out where, where I can stand to, to do the booming. Um, just, it just really involves taking a really, the most constructive approach you can possibly take instead of blaming or saying, Hey, this is dumb. There's nowhere for me to be or to hold the boom pole say, Hey, uh, I'm wondering if we can kind of work this out. I I'm a little bit squeezed here. There's not really a great place for me to go, or I'm worried that perhaps we will end up with a shadow in the background or whatever, because of where I'm going to have to hold the boom. Um, those are the just kind of things. Just take a constructive approach to develop a friendly relationship, read the cues, the nonverbal and the verbal cues about, um, you know, what the, what the team is doing and, and they need a lot of time when, when they're setting up lighting, for example, on the sets that I've worked on where we did have people dedicated to that, um, or even if it was just the DP setting up lighting, 
Um, on the smaller ones, you know, you can, it's important, I think, to kind of just at least introduce yourself at the start during, if there are any pre-production meetings to introduce yourself and just get to know them and, you know, let them know that you're looking forward to working with them and collaborating with them. Um, but then I think it's important to also say, hey, you know, for these, each of these scenes, I'm, I'm wondering if you've got, you know, if they have lighting designs already worked out ahead of time, um, that's a little bit more rare, <laughs> I think, at least on the productions I've worked on. Um, but if you can just keep those, keep that relationship working well, ask enough questions and collaborate, go always go forward with a collaborative kind of approach as opposed to a, you know, I'm not doing this unless you change that. Um, any, anytime someone starts digging their heels in, it can get pretty tricky. Now, if the other group has already dug their heels in, is already kind of giving you a cold shoulder, um, I think you're just going to have to do the best that you can do. Uh, again, continue to be kind. You have to do, you know, if it requires you being the better person, be the better person. Um, those are just some tips that I have about that. I don't want to go into that too too deeply, but um, we could definitely have someone like Alan Williams come on and talk about some of his experiences on that front. But I think that's kind of his general approach as well. Also, know your stuff. Know roughly what a different... Uh, different lenses do in terms of the field of vision that they're picking up or the field of view that they're picking up so that you have a general idea of where your line needs to be in other words where you need to hold the boom microphone above so that you don't get into the shot um, understand the different types of lighting that are out there a lot of times i think on smaller sets now we're seeing a lot more led lighting i think on the in the bigger tv and film you're still seeing plenty of hmi um, and sometimes these things have, you know, the big ballast or whatever, and they make a buzzing noise. And so that's another thing you're going to have to work around, but understanding those different types of lighting, lighting, the different types of lights and what they, you know, the, the challenges that come along with each of them in terms of either size or where they need to be placed or the buzzing noise that they make, whatever the case may be, because the, the way you position your microphone may change based on whatever noise sources there may be right on set. So I think it's really important to learn those things as well so that you're better prepared and you don't have to ask as many questions of these people the gaffer and, and their team that are really really busy trying to get set up for the next shot and usually they're the ones that um, it takes the most time for them to get everything set so that you can actually start rolling for sound usually you can have that done so i think it's really important that instead of just wandering around kind of zoning out in between takes that you make sure right at the start of the, that setup period in between takes that you have everything ready check your batteries to see if you need to swap out any batteries especially for any wireless microphone systems that you have to kind of dig into the wardrobe and pull it out and, and replace batteries so do that as soon as you can um, and then just keep your eye on all of your other battery sources making sure everything is where it needs to be so that when the lighting department and camera department is ready to roll you're ready as well there's nothing <laughs> there's nothing more frustrating than say for example you took 45 minutes the whole crew took 45 minutes to get set up for the next shot. And then at the last second, you say, oh, wait, I need to change batteries. And they have to call out hold for sound. Um, the, as a professional, you need to be ready to go as soon as everyone else is ready to go. So usually our, our work makes it so that we can be ready to go before um, camera is ready to go. So just some thoughts there. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much what I, everything I wanted to cover there. Let's talk about isotope ozone and to do that let's go over to our mac here and take a look so isotope is a company the same company that makes rx which i think most of you have heard of ozone uh, according to isotope represents the future of mastering and what is mastering well you can go take a look at the wikipedia article and i might recommend it um, but i think it means different things to different people and there's a lot of nuance there but originally what it meant was making the final master copy from which all other copies that would go to retail that would be sold would be made from and usually those are on tape um so anyway so that was the original idea but i think there are a lot of other things that happen during mastering these days and that includes other things like equalizing audio to you know equalizing things to optimize the overall sound to optimize loudness to prevent to make sure that you're not um, clipping that you're meeting all the specifications in terms of the largest amplitude for your audio so that um, it all plays back on as many different types of playback devices as possible. So that's a general idea, and that's what Ozone was originally made for, but 
could you master audio or could you just could you use ozone to process audio that's just spoken word and i think the answer is yes it's probably overkill in some regards but let's just take a look at what, what it what it looks like and what it could be used for so i have a clip here last week we did a review of the new amaran uh, 200xs light and i got the price wrong actually for whatever reason i don't i don't know exactly how that happened but we had to go back and re-record a line so this is that re-recorded line and it looks a little bit like this this is recorded with a sennheiser mkh 50 and you can see we've got a, a decent amount of headroom there it's not nearly loud enough yet and let's just play it back so you can hear what it sounds like at the start it does have a one-year warranty which you can extend to two years by registering your light and then it is priced initially at 349 dollars us Okay, so that's where we're starting. It, a couple of things stick out to me. Um, number one, it's a little bit on the quiet side. And number two, it sounds a little bit thin. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at some of the things that we can do. Now, first of all, of all, let's get ozone. And let's just, the way you typically would use ozone is you would put it on your master bus. So you would process all of the audio for the entire program. And so... Let's go ahead and grab this. I've got the o I've got ozone right here. We'll drop that over here into the buses effects, just like that. And you can see ozone opens. And ozone has a whole bunch of different things. We're not going to cover everything here, obviously, today, but just demonstrate how we could potentially use it. But you've got equalizers. You can add a dynamic EQ. You've got a dynamics processor, an exciter, an imager, an impact module low end focus, master rebalance, match EQ, all sorts of all sorts of things, a spectral shaper, stabilizer, a vintage compressor, a vintage EQ, a vintage limiter and a vintage tape saturation plugin. So you've got a whole bunch of different things. Obviously, a bunch of those we won't use for just mono dialogue <laughs> or even dual mono dialogue. But let me just kind of give you a sense for how I would approach this. Um, we have the maximizer. We'll use this to get our loudness and that'll be our, the main thing that we're going to run for here in the end. But before we get to that, um, I might want to just apply some EQ. Now, if I had multiple tracks and I wanted to EQ each of the individual tracks, I could have come up here as well. And in our case, let's use the dynamic EQ. I could actually drop one of these on each of the individual dialogue tracks as well. So in this case, this instance here is a dynamic EQ. And a dynamic EQ is an interesting one because it's a combination, essentially, of an equalizer. So you can change, you can either boost or cut individual frequencies, or, it, well, and at the same time, it actually treats those little boost or cut points like a compressor or an expander. So it doesn't actually apply the change until there's energy at that frequency. And let me show you what I mean by this. So I'm going to go ahead and play through the audio. And while I'm playing, I'm going to go ahead and make some adjustments so you can hear what it sounds like. So here we go. It does have a one-year warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light. And then it is priced initially at $349 US. It does have a one-year warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light. And then it is priced initially at $349 US. It does have a one-year warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light. And then it is priced initially at $349 US. It does have a one year warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light. And then it is priced initially at $349 US. It does have a one year warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light. And then it is priced initially at $349 US. It does have a one year warranty. Okay, we'll stop there. So the main thing I did here is I just was really, it does still sound a little bit thin to me. And usually my first approach is to come here and do some cuts here in the resonances, kind of in the one and two kilohertz range on my particular voice, at least. And that's going to differ for every other voice. But what you'll notice here is when I play it back, it's not actually applying that cut until it actually encounters energy with that, you know, some some actual sound in that frequency range. So let me go ahead and play it back again and watch how this white line here responds here. That's the EQ as it's being applied dynamically. Warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light, and then it is priced initially at three hundred and forty-nine dollars US. Okay, so that's one thing you could do. Um, the dynamic EQ and. 
let's go ahead and maybe there's I want to I want to actually show you the the vintage we talked about this a few weeks ago there's a vintage EQ as well let me go ahead and drop that in this is on the individual dialogue track as well now one of the things we talked about when we talked about EQ is that there's this concept that's that's used a lot in the music world especially where you can actually boost and cut low end bass at the same time and get an interesting effect where you actually get more bass but it doesn't get woofy or wooly or really kind of muffled sounding and let me demonstrate how that works here and how i would apply that so i'm going to go ahead and play back and we will make some adjustments here it does have a one-year warranty which you can extend to two years by registering your light and then it is priced initially at 349 dollars us it does have a one-year warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light, and then it is priced initially at $349 US. It does have a one-year warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light, and then it is priced initially at $349 US. It does have a one-year warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light, and then it is priced initially at $349 US. It does have a one-year warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light, and then it is priced initially at $349 US. It does have a one-year warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light, and then it is priced initially at $349 US. It does have a one-year warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light, and then it is priced initially at $349 US. Okay, so I, I made the changes there. What I did is I boosted the bass by about 4 dB, and I also applied this low cut at the same time. So what that does is it has the effect of adding a little bit more bass weight to the overall sound, but also controls it and keeps it from getting out of control and really, again, woofy or wooly sounding. And then at the same time, I also added a boost here at 10 kilohertz above the, the sibilance range just to add a little bit more clarity or air back to the overall sound. And then at the end there, what I did is I played them back. Um, I turned them off and then turned them back on so you can hear it. In fact, let's go do that again. I'm going to start with them off, and then I'll turn those back on in just a moment here. In fact, let's turn that instance off as well. Okay, so here it is with them off. It does have a one-year warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light, and then it is priced initially at $349 U.S. It does have a one-year warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light, and then it is priced initially at $349 US. Okay. So that is sort of a, if you wanted that sort of broadcasty sound, um, that is how you would achieve it, or that's one way to achieve it. And again, using this vintage EQ is how we achieved it in this particular case. Okay. So overall, that's uh, getting us closer to where we need to be, but it's still a little on the quiet side. And in fact, I forgot to do one thing beforehand. This was another question that came up. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn those off for now. Um, another question that came up is how do you, or that came up is how do you match the levels of multiple clips? And the way you can do that is coming into, right, we're good. This is individually resolved, Fairlight, of course, but it's um, this, they make some pretty nice tools for doing that. The first thing is you can right click on a clip and choose analyze audio levels. And I'm going to use this ITURBS 1770 4 um, standard. That's the, the kind of the most recent ITU standard. Go ahead and click analyze. And you can see right now our overall loudness is minus 31. And we generally, you know, for, for YouTube, for spoken word videos, I usually aim for minus 17 or minus 16 LUFS, so it's actually quite a bit quieter right now. Our live streams, we usually target minus 23. That's about what you're hearing right now as I talk. Um, and at the same time on this, this, this recording, this clip here, we also have 11.3 dB of headroom. That is, there is 11.3 dB between the loudest possible, 0 dB, and the highest uh, peak right now on this waveform. So we have some room to actually bump that up. In fact, let's go ahead and bump it up to minus 21 as a start before we do anything with, with ozone. So I'm going to right click here and choose normalize audio levels. And we've already got it set to minus 21. We'll go ahead and set the normalization mode to the same thing, the ITUR BS 1770-4. I changed the target true peak level to minus 1.5. I want to make sure I keep at least 1.5 dB of headroom there. 
and then our target loudness we're going to make minus 21 because we had enough headroom to actually get there so i'll click normalize and boom there it is <laughs> so now that's already playing much louder let's go ahead and play that back now be careful um keep an eye or keep a finger on your volume here this is going to be louder than it was before let's play it back it does have a one-year warranty which you can extend to two years by registering your light and then it is priced initially at 349 dollars us okay definitely running hotter now what i'm going to do i'm going to turn our overall levels on the mac down just a little bit because my voice is going to be a lot quieter than this playback audio so let's play it back on again it does have a one-year warranty which you can extend to two years by registering your light and then it is priced okay i'm just doing that for the purpose of this live stream just because there's a disparity between my spoken word level right now and what's going to be playing back from the mac so i just adjusted it here in my mixer in the atem so that i won't blow your ears out so <laughs> just explain okay now the thing is i probably should have done that ahead of time and i forgot to do it um, before i did these other two things here so let's go ahead and turn the first one on again this was our dynamic eq this should not make it louder because i only applied cuts so let's play it back again first with it off initially at 349 dollars us it does have a one-year warranty which you can extend to two years by registering your light and then it is priced initially at 349 dollars us it does have a one-year warranty which you can extend to two years by registering your light and then it is priced initially at 349 dollars us okay it does have that that'll work for us so we didn't um our boosts in the vintage eq here we're not so extreme that it created any problems so um, that's the one thing you always have to check on is make sure that you're not you know even if you've done some compression ahead of the eq um, the levels can change once you eq them because you are boosting or cutting levels and here in our case for example we actually boosted 4.2 db um, at 100 hertz and then made a similar cut um, around that range we also did a high boost at 10 kilohertz of 4.5 db and that wasn't enough to to create any problems so you would start to hear distortion if things were getting too loud there and you can of course watch your overall meters to make sure you're not clipping okay so that's what we can do there as far as eq and um yeah do two different types of eq there you can mix and match those as you like and then here we have what is called our maximizer now for our maximizer i want to make sure that we keep 1.5 db of headroom so i want to make sure that i bring this down here what this maximizer does actually let me take a step back what does the maximizer do the maximizer is in essence a compressor and limiter built into one it's sort of like the core one of the core features of isotope ozone and this can be used to optimize your loudness levels now before we actually do anything here we want to make sure that we're hitting our target so i'm going to close that for just a second and of course here in davinci resolve in the fair light we have this loudness meter right here and what i need to do is first set my target so i'm going to come over here to the file menu and go down to project settings and i'm going to come over here to the fair light tab and then here i get to set my loudness target and i have it set to minus 17. let's 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 do minus 17 for now right now we're at about minus 21 maybe minus 20 but we want to get to minus 17. so we don't have a long ways to go but we'll go ahead and save that actually i already had it set to that so i just cancel out of that if you hadn't go ahead and change it to your target again in our case minus 17 and then save it what that means now is that this meter right here will be measuring how close we are above or below our target of minus 17. so let's go ahead and play through this and let's see where we're sitting right now here we go um let me go ahead and turn off this last instance of ozone it does have a one-year warranty which you can extend to two years by registering your light and then it is priced initially at 349 dollars us okay so currently we're minus 3.7 maybe almost 4 db or minus 4 lufs lower than we really want to be in our, our full whole target so we're going to use this maximizer to get us up to that level and let's go ahead and turn that on i'm going to go and click that button right there now it's active so while we're doing this boosting of the levels by using this kind of mastering limiter slash 
compressor, um, we have a whole bunch of different modes we can use here. And if you want to see what the different modes do, you just hover over them. And this one uses intelligent release control, smooth and thick limiting for a rich sound. That doesn't sound bad. Um, here, and these are nuances. I mean, once you get to this level, you're, you're talking about some serious nuance. Uh, this one here, again, intelligent release control two, clear and sharp limiting to preserve peaks. Okay, that, that could be interesting. Um, we also have here in this third one, uh, surgical limiting tailored to your audio. Uh, and then when, if you do select that one, you get a couple of different options there. You've got, if you want a pumping effect, a balanced effect, a crisp effect, or a clipping effect, um, reduced pumping and distortion. Uh, let's let's go ahead and go with that. Let's uh, let's start there. Maybe change it to classic. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do: be careful. Um, stay near your volume knob so that you can adjust if you need to. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and adjust this threshold right here. And what that does is the farther down I go, the more it's going to start compressing and limiting the audio and boosting the overall levels. So um, just kind of keep. Keep your hand near your volume. So I think we've got everything under control here. We reduced it in the mixer, so you shouldn't it shouldn't be too bad. Um, but we're going to go ahead and uh, adjust that as we play back. I'm also going to adjust a couple of other things here. We do have a, what's called a soft clipper that adds some. It's sort of um, kind of em emulates some analog gear where you start to get saturation before you get actual distortion. Um, that kind of it stimulates that. I don't know that we really want that. We also do want some transient emphasis here. We want to make sure that we retain some of those transients without, you don't want to just blow them away. And the reason for that is it, it actually helps with articulation. With spoken word audio, you need some of the transients there to understand what's being said. It's part of how we as humans hear and communicate. So I'm going to probably start with that somewhere up in, up in this realm here. Here I'm at 44%. Okay, let's go ahead and play back, and I'm going to adjust that threshold. Here we go. It does have a one-year warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light, and then it is priced initially at $349 US. It does have a one-year warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light, and then it is priced initially at $349 US. It does have a one-year warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light, and then it is priced initially at $349 US. It does have a one-year warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light, and then it is priced initially at $349 US. It does have a one-year warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light, and then it is priced initially at $349 US. It does have a one-year warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light, and then it is priced initially at $349 US. It does have a one-year warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light, and then it is priced initially at $349 US. It does have a one-year warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light, and then it is priced initially at $349 US. Okay, I think we're getting pretty close here. I was keeping an eye, you noticed on the loudness meter up here, we ended up at plus 0.4. That's gonna be pretty good for what we wanted to achieve. So I think we're in a pretty good spot here. So what we can do is, let's go ahead and render this out. So I'm gonna come back home. And I'm going to, once we've done all this, what we can do is bounce out this new mix to see, you know, how, how it actually came out, just to confirm that we got where we wanted to get. Um, so I can come up to my timeline, and I can bounce this mix to a new track. And I'm just going to say, okay, take, take the main bus, that's the main output, and go ahead and let's, let's bake in all these things we did. Let's bake in the, the dynamic EQ, the vintage EQ, and the maximizer and make a new track out of that. That's what we're doing here. So I click OK, and it created this new track for us. So let's go ahead and do a Shift-Z to make it so that we can see everything. And I'm gonna open this up. There's our new audio. I'm gonna go ahead and mute this right here. And now that we have our new audio, let's go ahead and turn the all of this off, these instances of ozone off. We should now be able to play this back and watch our meter here and it should give us, it should tell us that we're sitting right around minus 17 LUFS. Let's just confirm that. 
It does have a one-year warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light. And then it is priced initially at $349 US. Okay, pretty close. Half an LUFS above that, that's actually about where we were seeing when we were making our adjustments. So that's one way you could do this, um, using ozone to loudness normalize your audio and sweeten it up a little bit with some EQ as well. So let's pause there and let's go to the chat. Danny has a question, it looks like. Do you need to talk? Do you wanna, wait a second. Danny has a microphone today. So we're going to let her talk. I was wondering if you could play the original again, like the two to compare. We will go ahead and play the orig original again. So let me do this. Uh, we are going to come here. Uh, do that. Unmute the original. All right. Here we go. Here's the original. And then right after this, I will play back the processed audio. It does have a one-year warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light. And then it is priced initially at $349 US. It does have a one-year warranty, which you can extend to two years by registering your light. And then it is priced initially at $349 US. Okay. So there we are. Let's head on out to the chat and see what we've got. Danny says nothing in the chat. What? Let's... <laughs> Hi, audio buff. Uh, we could go. We got hit with a tornado. I'm ready for something normal. Okay, thank you. I hope everything's okay um, and that you're doing well. Oklahoma State University is studying the sound signature of supercell th thunderstorms. They believe a pre-tornadic storm is producing 0 0.5 hertz and below. I'd like to make a video on that study. Um, let's switch back to our main camera. I would just say... Jude, be really careful. <laughs> if you are going to be chasing tornadoes, um, be really careful. That sounds really interesting. 0.5 hertz and below. Unreal. Just for reference for those, um, we normally, uh, generally people can hear, I can hear down to definitely 40 hertz. Um, some people claim they can hear or feel down to 20 hertz. I think I could probably feel to 20 hertz, but below that, I generally can't hear or feel it, um, depending on, I mean, maybe if it's super powerful, I guess, but 0.5 hertz sounds uh, pretty terrifying and amazing at the same time. <laughs> Hi, Linda. I came in late, but that was some cool voodoo. I will have to rewatch the first 30 minutes. Absolutely. So we were just taking a look at isotope ozone. And in fact, um, let's go back to the Mac here really quickly, just so I can highlight one thing. So just like with RX, there are different versions. We'll compare the different versions. You can come to their site to see exactly what each of them has. I think everything that we demonstrated here today is available in the Elements version. Um, however, uh, I did notice this when I was looking at it yesterday. It looks like Ozone 10 Standard um, is actually cheaper than Elements right now. <laughs> so... If you are interested in picking it up, now is probably a good time in terms of pricing. Normally, I guess it's $250. Right now, it's at half price. And the advanced version is also half of its normal price, which is $500. This is probably going to be more for music mastering engineers. I don't think most of us are going to need something like that. But definitely the standard version would do everything that we generally need to do um, based on what I know about our audience here. So with that, back to the chat. Yanti. Uh, live, live stream yourself, spend money on external compressor limiter like a DBX-286 or similar, or the built-in on the ATEM Mini. When you use the channel XLR as input to ATEM, DBX is much... Is there more to that one? No? Cameras. Oh, cameras. When you use the camera's XLR as input to the ATEM, DBX... DBX is great, yeah. No, I mean, if you're doing live, live, yeah, I use, uh, we. well, today I'm using Shelford Channel, which is an analog piece of gear that includes a compressor and an EQ. Danny's using the Universal Audio 6176, which is a channel strip that has a compressor and kind of a very crude EQ to it. So, yeah, I think for live, we, we tend to use analog processors like that. I do that at work as well for our live streams. Um, both of our live stream presenters have DBX-286s in their signal chain. So yeah. we do it live. 
camera XLR HDMI. Yeah, that's exactly how we do it as well. So actually what we do is, yeah, we do, we do the audio through a channel strip, then to the camera, then the camera goes HDMI to the ATEM. And that's, yeah, agreed. Good, 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 good it works. <laughs> I don't know what else to say, but yes, it works. Um, Harry, welcome. Hurrah, made it. Sorry, I kept Pincer waiting. Um, Pincer's doing okay. He's, uh, He's happy to see you as well, waving his pincer for you right there. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Christopher, I guess the question is, if you already have RX, is there anything in Ozone that is really compelling, or is it just a different way of using mostly the same kinds of tools? Um, good question. That's, a, that's actually a really good question. I think what Ozone focuses on, they share some of the same technologies, no doubt. There is an EQ match in Ozone as well, which you only get, I think, in the higher ends of RX. But Ozone is more focused on EQ and compression. There is no compressor built into the uh, into RX. There is a limiter built into the loudness module, but there, there are basically no parameters. It's just a brick wall limiter. Um, so if you want to finesse things, and I think with Dialog Audio, it makes sense to finesse things. I'm not necessarily saying that you have to have ozone, but I would generally try to use um, a compressor that's a... Yeah, you're going to need a compressor of some sort. I would pre prefer to compress than just hard limit everything. When you get those, even if you're not hitting 0 dB, if you use a hard limiter and bring it down to minus 1.5 and you just boost your overall levels up, you're going to chop off all the tops of your waveforms. And that's actually perceptible. Even though you're not clipping, you can tell that it's like, oh, that was really was processed in a really kind of harsh, harsh way, using a compressor is going to get you a, a result that sounds a little smoother. So that's what I would recommend. So um, I, I also like in Ozone that there is the Vintage EQ. I think the Vintage EQ, for those that want to get that broadcasty sound and want to add weight to their voices or to the voices of the people that they're, that they're you know, that they're working with, um, I would say that having a Vintage equalizer ozone's not doesn't have the only one out there there are lots of others that emulate Poltec equalizers which is kind of the idea that that's based on where you can boost the bass and also cut the bass at the same time um, that's a really useful tool as well so again ozone isn't the only way to do that but you don't have that it doesn't come with rx you don't have a tool exactly like that with rx so those are some thoughts okay now, T, thanks, but my question was analog DBX-286 versus the A10 mini compressor on digital side. Okay, now I understand. Thank you for the clarification. Um, you can do it, of course, either way. You can achieve pretty good results either way. What you'd have to be careful of on the A10 mini is that the A10 mini is, a, is all digital. So what you can't do with an A10 Mini that you can do with an A with a DBX286 is that a D DBX286 is a is an analog piece of gear, and the way that the compressor works is you intentionally. Um, let me just see what the the word actually says on the control here. Yeah, it's, it's it has a what's called a drive parameter. So you get to drive, and in essence, what you're doing is it's another. It's another amplifier that takes the level from the preamplifier, the audio that you've already brought, and then it has, a f a, in essence, a fixed threshold for the compressor. And what you do is you drive the audio, you amplify the audio further until it hits up against that threshold. Um, so it's a different approach, and it's an analog compressor. In the ATEM software control, you're working with a completely digital processor, so you cannot expect the digital processors within the ATEM software control to make your audio sound good if you're already bringing it in and it's already clipped at whatever device you're using. So whether that's coming directly into the ATEM's microphone inputs or coming through a, a roadcaster or whatever or a, some other mixing board or your camera, if it's already clipped, these uh, processors within ATEM software control cannot fix those. The clippings, the damage is already done. Um, so that's one consideration. But you can get good results. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to rely on instead digitally boosting your overall signal. So you're going to want to make sure that if you are going to use the ATEM software control, dynamic controls, or dynamic processors, you want to make sure that the audio that's coming in, maybe via an 
I don't know, however you're feeding audio into your ATEM, that it's not clipped, that it has plenty of headroom, 12 dB or something like that. And then what you're going to do is you may have to apply some amplification, adjust the threshold, and apply some makeup gain. So some of that's going to be digital gain. And um, that that comes with some things like plenty of noise floor. So <laughs> uh, you, may, you want to make sure you're using a really clean preamplifier in as much as possible. So those are some thoughts. I think you can do it both ways. Both of them are perfectly valid. Yeah, you can get good results either way. I personally prefer analog gear when I can use it. I just feel like you can really dial in the sound. Um, they have, most analog gear has non-linearities that, that um, in most cases actually sound pretty good. So <laughs> uh, the DBX-286 is a great example of that. It, it, it just has a sound to it that's actually pretty decent. So um, yeah, you just have to use a, a slightly different philosophy if you are going to rely on the ATEM Mini's dynamics processing where you can't drive that amplification as much as you could as you can through an analog piece of gear where you're intentionally driving the audio up into the threshold to get the overall sound. Hopefully that makes sense, but I guess the short version, if you have both, I if I had both, which I do, I would probably use the DBX instead of the ATEM. I, I, I wouldn't say instead of, I would say I would also apply a limiter in the ATEM as well on top of everything else. Okay, Danny tells me I need to move on, so we're moving on. Mike, do the same for my wild li wildfire briefings, analog to my GH5-2 with the XLR adapter and then output all through HDMI. Also lets make me also lets me take an output to reinforce the live sound through a PA. Very good. Thanks for sharing, Mike, for the wildfire briefings. Similar type setup. Carl, what are your thoughts about Deity Sound discontinuing its high-end mic transmitters and receivers? It's really a shortage. Is it really a shortage of parts or are they going to redesign? I don't know. I don't have any sort of I mean, I know Andrew, but I don't know. I don't have any sort of inside information on that in particular. And if I did, I probably couldn't share it. Um, but I don't know. If I if I were Andrew, I'd be redesigning it right now. Hopefully they are. I hope they are. Or maybe working on a UHF system instead of a 2.4 gigahertz system. Okay. Hello from New Zealand. Big fan of your work. I have a question. Is minus 35 LUFS okay for an initial recording? My raw recordings often come in this low with an MKH-50, even with a decent amount of gain. Recorded with a Tascam X8, waiting for a Zoom F8M Pro to arrive. Minus 35 is a little bit on the low side, but that's actually okay, um, when you're, especially when you're working with a Zoom F8M Pro, super clean preamps, so that means you're leaving plenty of headroom. I think that's fine. You, you, you could push it a little bit more, um, so then you don't have to boost it quite so much in post. But with those two recorders, the, especially the Zoom F8N Pro, um, boosting that much in post is not a, there's no problem with that. So, but I would probably gain up just a touch more, three or four dB more. Uh, Harry asks, is there a close competitor to Ozone? Oh my goodness, there are so many plugins out there. If you go to waves.com, there are there are thousands of plugins, um, and I think Ozone is kind of a big package that a lot. I, I don't really live in the mastering world. I'm not a mastering engineer, so I don't really know. But there are lots of other plugins out there. Um, I get the sense that Ozone is one that most mastering engineers do do have and they do use, in addition to others. But yeah, I think that's it's a pretty common one. Matt, uh, Curtis Shot Audio or anyone, have you used WavePad? It's a free basic audio program. I'm teaching a class via a foundation for content creators. Uh, wannabe, so they want everything free or cheap. I have not used WavePad. Um, so if anyone in the chat has used it, curious of what your impressions are, if you could share that. Love to hear about that. Ted's question. <sighs> Let's get to Ted's question. Okay, Danny said, let's get to Ted's question, which he submitted ahead of time. And here we go. So first of all, congratulations to Ted. Ted said, I just bought a Sennheiser MKH-50 mic stand and XLR cable for recording voice when using my teleprompter to create online lessons. 
I know it's mostly experimentation to figure these things out, but Curtis, if you have any tips on mic placement, distance from talent, anything of uh, angling of the mic, etc., UAD Apollo plugins you like to use with the mic, gain settings, and such, it would be really helpful to hear how you use the mic for capturing dialogue. I really like the sound, but I feel like I'm boosting gain so much that my noise floor becomes too high. I have the mic about 1.5 feet above my mouth, about six inches in front of my head and angled back toward my mouth. Okay, um, Ted, first of all, congrats on the microphone. That's very exciting. Uh, it is one of my favorite microphones. Um, if you can get the microphone a little closer, I would first start there. Um, the thing with boom microphones is they are going to pick up room tone. That just is a reality. If you have anything else in your room that you can turn off that's making noise, um, as we as we demonstrated here, I, <laughs> we're actually this camera right here has a fan that runs in it until you start recording. So I actually turn it on to record, even though I don't use the recording, just so that it will turn the fan off during the live stream. Um, so do anything you can to remove noise sources within your room. Move the microphone down a little bit closer if you can. Um, I don't know if you have really wide framing for your for your shot, but I would, if, if possible, I would go more head and shoulders, and that will generally allow you to get close, a little bit closer than, than 18 inches or 1.5 feet. Um, and then I would experiment from there. Also make sure that you're using the, remember, you're using a directional microphone. So if you do have a noise source that you cannot control, that you cannot turn off in the room, adjust the angle of the microphone to see if you can eliminate some of that noise using the microphone's polar pattern. That's one thing that, that can be really helpful. So that instead of just randomly changing things around, which can be a daunting task because there are so many things you can try, um, I would start there with identifying where the noise sources are in the room and using the, the, the polar pattern of the microphone. So not the very back of the microphone, but off to more a little bit to the side and to the rear a bit. Uh, will typically help with that particular microphone since it's a super cardioid polar pattern. Um, also, experiment with um, if you've if you've got any blankets you can put on the floor. If you are working with if reverb is part of the issue, I don't know what the the room tone sounds like or the noise floor sounds like. But if it is, if it does have some reverberation, put putting any sort of blanket on the floor or other um, large flat surfaces, hard flat surfaces, that can also help to mellow some of that out, which will help. I think those are the main things. If there's anything else that anyone thinks of, definitely let our friend Ted know. Um, and happy recording in the meantime. Okay. Apollo, let's... Apollo plugins? Oh, Apollo plugins. I didn't cover those. So if you're looking to... Um, uh, the one, one I really like is... Well, there's some of the free ones are good. The LA-2A you can use, which is a really good one, um, which is a compressor. Basically, it's a limiting, it's a, it's a compressor in essence. Um, I like that one. The Vox Box, if you if you have the money to spend or if you don't already have it, the Vox Box is really really good. Um, it makes processing your audio. It has a deesser built in. It has a compressor. A um, little bit of EQ, if I remember right, as well. So, if you're trying to save some time in post, that can be a really good way to do it. And the the, the Vox Box sounds fantastic. So that's another one that I would probably recommend for spoken word audio. Gain settings? Gain settings depend. I mean, that's... Um, don't be afraid to push gain. The, um, the Apollos are have very good preamplifiers, so it's not a problem. Don't, don't fret about adding gain to get your levels where they need to be. But get your microphone closer if you want. It, that way you will automatically improve your signal to noise ratio. So you'll get more of your voice and less of the room no noise, noise floor. Um, that, that I would recommend that if you can do that. Okay, thank you. Danny helped me uh, make sure that I answered all the questions. So thanks for that, Ted, for submitting that ahead of time. Okay, what else have we got going in the chat here today? Thanks for the answer, you bet. Thanks for the question, uh, appreciate that. Will you be visiting NAB in April? You can just grab an Uber to that place. I'm in Europe, so it's far, <laughs> it's too far away, at least this year. Um, we're still, we haven't decided for certain. We might, um, we might go to NAB. Haven't, haven't decided for sure. Thanks so much, Ted. 
for the question. Okay, this is, we might need more clarification on this. All right, Rene asks, what do you, what to do to avoid that sonic robot sound? I think we're going to need a little bit more clarity on what that sonic robot sound is and what circumstances uh, under which you get that recording, or that sound in your recordings. Yeah, because I'm not sure. I mean, it can, it, this is very rare, but I have noticed that in some cases I have gotten uh, phase effects. When you get a shotgun microphone angled just a little bit off axis, and the sound, the same sound source is coming in both the side and the front at the same time, you'll get a kind of a warbling sound. Brrr, something like that, but that that's very rare. So I, w I wouldn't, don't imagine you're talking about that. Um, but we'd probably just need a little more clarity on what that is. All right. Oh, Stereo Thrilla is with us today. Thank you for your question. What's your stance on using first order filters on mics versus second order on mixers or recorders? Um, so some microphones have built in um, high pass filters, for example, uh, and they're usually, you know, they're operating in the purely in the analog space. Some recorders, depending on which one you're using, on the higher end will actually do some filtering in the analog stage as well, and in some cases even before the preamplifier. Um, so that would be the equivalent of doing that on a microphone. And some microphones are digital microphones, and so they're doing it in the digital domain. So it depends on the microphone, and it depends on the recorder. So usually the less expensive microphones and recorders We'll do it digitally, and the higher end will do it in an analog, uh, in an analog filter. So, I think ideally, I prefer to do it in the analog stage because um, then that gives your converter more headroom, especially if you're if you're record. Yeah, it just gives your head. It gives your your, in essence, your converter doesn't have to work as hard, um, and you're just filtering out stuff you don't need or want anyway. So, ideally, I would use a first order filter, a first order analog filter. Those are my thoughts on that. It's a good question. Very good question. Love your channel. Thank you for all you do for the audio community. You bet. Thank you. Thanks for coming by. And by the way, cool YouTube name. <laughs> I like it. Uh, Mike, back to analog gear. Have you ever thought about going down the 500 series module rabbit hole? I wish you wouldn't ask those kind of questions with Danny here. <laughs> because yes, I have thought about it. But then I saw the price tag and I didn't do it. And um, <laughs> Pinsler says, please don't do it. Um, it's actually not a bad, it's not a bad idea. I mean, let's be honest, the Shelford channel, I think when, when we bought it, it was $3,500. It's ridiculously expensive. You could buy a, a, a set of 500 series pros, you know, preamps and processors and the, um, you know, the rack box with the power supply, 500 series for probably less than that. So sounds fun Mike <laughs> but no we're not we know no immediate plans to do that we've got the equivalent here when it's just in a bigger rack okay we have time for a few more questions all right Danny says we have time for a few more questions here love to hear about any audio projects you've got sound projects you've got going uh what you've got coming up nothing there at the moment Nothing there at the moment. Okay. Oh, wait. Thanks. Thanks, Multiply. Appreciate you making the time. You bet. Thanks for coming by today. Appreciate that as well. I'm curious. Let's do a poll. Um, I've wanted to do this for a while. And the question is this. Which digital audio workstation do you all use? I'm curious if it's Adobe Audition, DaVinci Resolve Fairlight, Pro Tools, Logic, um, Audacity, or something else. There are a lot of others. I'm not. I can't name them all. But <laughs> go ahead and, and let us know out there um, what you've got. Okay, Danny says we have something here. Hello from Holland. I wanted to do some audio processing on my iPad for live conferences for Zoom and not in post. Just run it through some plugins such as an EQ and compressor before sending it to Zoom. 
I connect an external microphone XLR to the iPad Pro using the MixPre 3.2, but this seems to be very difficult to do on an iPad. I can easily do it on a Mac using Audio Hijack, but on iPad, it is a bit trickier. I was wondering if you know a way to do it, maybe an app that can do some audio routing. I have Audio Bus app, but Zoom doesn't appear as an audio output. I have never tried to do that on an iPad, I'll be honest. Um, if anybody else here has done that and you know of any apps that could help here, please let our new friend Nathaniel know. If I hope I, I hope I said your name right. Okay, let's see. We've got people coming in. Some people see DJ Ware is using Logic Pro. Um, Fairlight and Reaper from JHB. Linda says, we're struggling at work to uh, choose one <laughs> or to select one. Alex T uses Audition. Carl uses uh, Fairlight, Harry Knapp Audition, Mike Fairlight, and Isotope Elements. Um, <laughs> Guy uses Audition, but migrating slowly to Fairlight. Zach uses Audition. Shoji uses Logic. There's one Audacity. There's an, somebody's using Audacity? Okay, good. Um, sorry, which is the best? I don't know if there is a best oh, one. He's asking about sound treatment. Oh, sound treatment. Okay, that's a different one. That's a, Studio One. Until I started using DaVinci. Okay, Randy, sounds... Uh, yeah, Studio One is quite uh, quite a following. I have some friends that do mu primarily music, and they have really, really love Studio One. Uh, Linda says, mostly Audition and Pro Tools. Some want to switch to Hindenburg. Uh, Daniel, both DaVinci Fairlight and Adobe Audition. Matt says SoundForge on the PC and Logic on the Mac. Uh, ShareFlogs is using Steinberg, Nuendo. Uh, Ken is using Logic Pro for sound effects editing, Pro Tools for film dialogue editing. Does anyone still remember Peter Quiskard from Cool Edit Pro? Wow, Cool Edit Pro, which became Adobe Audition ev eventually. Um, all right, cool. Um, we do have some more questions. Let's go ahead and jump to those. Okay. Do you have a MixPre 10 2 and Scorpio to compare their physical size? Um, I don't have a Scorpio on size uh, or on hand, no. Um, I, I, Sound Advice has lent one to me for a, a few weeks so that I could um, make a video about it, but I don't have one on hand. It's substantially larger and heavier. <laughs> I can tell you that. Um, Edwin, I'm working on sound treatments, so foam, panels, or blankets, if not all three. I am using Audis Audacity for voiceover. Um, I would probably go for panels and blankets, heavy blankets. Um, the problem with foam is that it will, and the reason I say heavy blankets is heavy blankets will will get some more of the mid frequencies and just into the start of the lower frequencies. Foam will just get the high frequencies. So it'll basically make it kind of an unbalanced sound generally. So I would generally avoid foam. Um, and then panels, especially with the right material inside of them, like uh, like these, um, those, my, this chair is driving me crazy. Have you noticed all the squeaks? It's my, my chair has started squeaking. <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna have to take care of that. Um, but, f uh, the panels can typically capture more bass sound. So they're more even in terms of the overall frequency of sound that they will trap and, um, attenuate. So panels I think are ideal, but I find that the heavy sound blankets work pretty nicely as well. Somebody actually said that um, Harbor Freight in the United States just released some new furniture pad blankets, so moving blankets, and they're quite heavy as well. I haven't tried them, but they're quite affordable. I think they're $15 for an, a 4 by 8 blanket. So those are probably... I, I It'd be interesting to test those versus a proper sound blanket, which actually is going to cost more like $60 US for each blanket. But those are some thoughts there for Edwin. Uh, Kevin, did you build your sound cart or buy it? I'm looking at building my own cart and wondering if you had any pointers on where to find good information and plans. I actually bought mine from a company called Soundcart. Um, <laughs> it's actually a, it's a British company. I believe it's a guy who was a, is or was a production sound mixer and makes uh, various carts. And I got the Soundcart Mini which is a smaller one. So it, I generally essentially leave my mixer in a in an Orca bag and I 
mount that on the cart itself so I can actually do both. I can I can be a little bit more agile and I can take it off the cart and go use it as a, as a traditional bag if I need to do that quickly and then come back and put it on the cart for the majority of the time. So I don't know of anywhere to get... I think there was I think there were some Facebook groups or something where people were sharing pictures of Zuka bags and other things like that. You might be able to find some information in the the sound forums out there on Facebook. I'm, I'm not on Facebook, so I don't know for sure. That's just what I've heard. Okay, here's the last one. Okay, Danny says this is the last question. What is your favorite digital audio workstation and why? Uh um, well, here here's the thing. I, everyone is biased because everyone starts somewhere, and I'm biased too. So I worked in Adobe Audition first, and that's where I did a lot of. Well, that's not true. I worked in Audacity first, and then I and then I started working in Audition, and so I just know it better than I know the others. So I have Pro Tools, I have Logic, um, I have Fairlight. I'm probably most comfortable today in. Audition and Fairlight. And the reality is, is that, well, Fairlight has a few things that are a little bit funky still, I would say. There's some rough edges that they're, and I, at the velocity that they're going, I think they'll get those addressed within the next couple of years. But um, I think it largely comes down to what you're familiar with. A lot of them, when they get, once they get to a certain maturity level, are pretty good at doing almost everything you need them to do. It's not like one sounds better than another one. Um, it's largely about does it work in a way that allows you to work quickly and get the results you need. So Studio One, a lot of musicians, a lot of people mixing music really love Studio One. Um, lots of people love Logic. Lots of people have worked in Pro Tools for years and years, and that's the one advantage that Pro Tools has. It's the digital audio workstation that's probably been a, around longer than most of the others. Um at least it's been around longer than Fairlight in its current incarnation, we could say at least. Um, <laughs> so in any case, um, I think it really comes down to what you prefer. I, I, I am looking at moving away from Audition. I don't, I don't, I don't edit in Premiere uh, personally, so I just don't have a need for that round trip process. It is a little bit easier if you are doing your editing in Premiere, your video editing in Premiere. So... Um, I'm probably I, I've starting to started to get it more into Fairlight, but Fairlight has some rough edges, and I and I've taken a couple of kind of starting classes in Pro Tools. Pro Tools is probably the most mature. Um, it has its own quirks. Avid is kind of a funny company, um, but in the film and commercial industry, the the commercial and commercial video world, Pro Tools is the tool that almost all dialogue sound editors and um, all of the post sound people are using for the most part just because it fits into the workflow and it's been around long enough and everyone that knows how to use it is um, well everyone that works in that industry is used to it they, <laughs> that's what they know so anyway there's some thoughts on that you and Matt should get together for chairs uh, Matt says my chair started squeaking as well trouble is I can't I just can't use any chair I've been looking for a new one yeah I same here all right everybody um thank you for coming by today it's been great spending this hour with you um get out there and make some great sound this week and we'll talk to you again next week take care everybody